to wrap numbers around, but um, could not have been done without um, the, the amazing faculty and staff and students and alumni and friends of the college. It really is a, a extremely vibrant, strong community. And, and that's what makes these kinds of things happen. So um, I have just had the privilege to be uh, uh, the team captain for the last four years. So uh, that's how I look at it. But I, I just want to begin by welcoming you all. We are so excited that you joined us tonight for what is an engaging multi-part series that we've had over the course of this spring on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The uh, Professional Development Committee of our uh, very engaged alumni network, and we're so fortunate uh, to have such uh, engaged alumni, um, but the Professional Development Committee has worked diligently and, and strong throughout the, the, the spring to create a series that's relevant for all educators as we move through this important moment in history. At the College of Education, values of diversity, inclusion, and equity, as is clear in the strategic plan that Kurt referenced, are central to our work. And we welcome any opportunity to engage uh, with our community and, and especially with our alumni and friends. So thank you so much for being here this afternoon with us. Our college community has come together this year to process the very disturbing um, uh, racism that we've seen in our communities um, and the resulting racial unrest of 2021 and the long and deep roots of anti-Black racism in our history as a nation. Working together as a community and building on the amazing expertise of our faculty uh, which we're very fortunate to have in our college. We created our new Council on Racial Equity and Justice, otherwise known as COURAGE. Um, so if you think of the, the words Council on Racial Equity and Justice, it's spelled C-O-R-E-J. It is an unconventional spelling of the word courage, but it works phonetically. And I think it, most importantly, it delivers a very powerful message. Uh, that is, this work takes courage. I've appointed our own uh, Dr. Bridget Turner Kelly to lead COURAGE with a mission of elevating research and amplifying the voices of faculty, staff, and students on matters of structural and systemic racism, white supremacy, anti-Blackness, and the intersecting issues of oppression and power within our own college. So courage is starting at home. We're looking at ourselves and what we can do better um, at the interpersonal level, but maybe even uh, more importantly, at the institutional level in terms of our policies and practices, how we can do better. The goal is to create a more equitable and inclusive college and campus community where we can all thrive. And a secondary related goal is ensuring that our graduates leave here committed to addressing structural racism in all of its forms through K-16, K-20 education and beyond. So I am uh, thrilled, very excited to learn tonight from Tiku Aiku, a master's uh, graduate in 2005, and Nathan Victoria, thank you both uh, very much for putting this presentation together. I'm incredibly grateful for the work of the Professional Development Committee of the College of Education Alumni Network and their leadership throughout this semester in bringing these conversations to you. I'm, I'm sad that this is the last of them because they have been so engaging um, and so enriching uh, for me. Uh, this committee includes Dr. Sharon Fries Britt, class of 1981, and received her PhD in 1994, and currently a, uh, a member of the College of Education faculty and a dear colleague of mine. Uh, Dr. Ebony Terrell Shockley uh, received her PhD in 2012, also a, a dear colleague, currently our executive director of teacher education uh, in the and part of our dean's uh, office leadership team. Uh, Tiki Aiku, a master's degree in 2005. And Dr. Mary Robinson, class of 1996, with her EDD in 2016. Uh, so I just want to really deeply thank all of you for your investment in, in this series this, uh, this semester. I'm also thankful for the leadership of the College of Education Alumni Network, uh, President Barbara Friedlander, class of 1985 uh, and MA in 1990, and Vice President Norca Padilla, class of 1987. Uh, you all have done so much for the college in terms of supporting us and, and helping advance uh, our mission. So, uh, so thank you so much for your leadership. And, uh, and to the, the general audience who's here with us today, I hope you will all consider joining the University of Maryland Alumni Association as members 
and support the work of the College of Education Alumni Network. This is an incredibly important part of our community um, and we are so grateful to have such engaged alumni. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Wonderful. I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Ebony Terrell Shockley. Good evening, everyone. We are very pleased to be able to invite all of you to uh, this auspicious occasion. Um, we want to, um, the Alumni Association wants you to um, receive us with open arms as we have been able to engage with so many of you for a long time now, including and beginning with the work of this alumni network this summer, where we engage with you in some instructional technology workshops and into the fall, as well as those of you who are joining us on this evening. The College of Education Alumni Network has worked really hard this year to engage the community in a panel of presentations. And we refer to those presentations as our EdTurp Dialogues. Feel free to tweet about them on the College of Education website um, on the range of topics, including uh, difficult dialogues. And today, disrupting biases, uncovering how privileges manifest in education. And on to that end, it is my honor to introduce our presenters. First, Ms. Tiki Aiku. Tiki currently serves as the Assistant Vice President for Professional Development at the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators, NASPA, a national organization for student affairs administrators in higher education. She leads the professional development, meetings, online learning, and program execution teams, which collectively plan and execute 30 to 50 national conferences every year. Tiki is also responsible for NASPA's international efforts, and she serves as the liaison to their Middle East and Latin America advisory boards. Prior to joining NASPA, Tiki served as the Associate Dean of Students at St. Timothy School. She was the Assistant Director of Student Programs at Northfield Mount Hermon School and Program Advising Coordinator at the University of Maryland. A nationally recognized speaker, she has presented on a wide range of topics impacting leadership, student development, and the importance of professional development. She's a proud graduate of Morgan State University, where she received her BA in Spanish and secondary education. And she is also very proud to be a Turk, having earned her MA degree in 2005 in student affairs, student affairs administration. Tiki is also an active member of the College of Education Board of Alumni, which we have described for you and we'll talk to you more about at the end. And we are so fortunate to have her as a member of the Professional Development Committee. Joining Tiki this evening is her colleague and co-presenter, Mr. Nathan Victoria. Mr. Nathan Victoria is a nationally recognized leader as well. He is a change agent and activist. Mr. Victoria has been featured nationally by several organizations for his active leadership and work on behalf of communities. He was featured as the executive of the future change agent, ASAE's Associations Now, and recognized as one of the Association Forum's 2018 Class of 40 Under 40 Award winners. Nathan has partnered with volunteers and staff to curate the arc of experience for the Society for Personality Assessment, or SPA, as the executive director and CEO. Prior to working with SPA, Nathan spent nearly 13 years at NAS NASPA, or NASPA, where he served as the senior director of recruitment, engagement, and volunteerism, and no doubt worked very closely with his colleague and co-presenter, Tiki. National is also, excuse me, Nathan is also a doctoral candidate in the Executive Leaders Program, Human and Organizational Learning at the George Washington University. He is a proud father, husband, and self-described radical activist scholar practitioner. That warms my heart just reading it. Colleagues, we are in for a treat as we learn from our speakers about disrupting biases. Ebony, you are incredible. I just wanted to make you stop talking about me. I, I just can't take it. Hey, y'all. Um, we're really excited to be here. Well, I'm going to skip the intros because Ebony did it better than I could ever do it myself. Uh, you can definitely hit us up on Twitter, um, but we want to get started. So I'm going to turn it over to Nathan, who it's always wonderful to hear all of these wonderful accolades that my dear frolic, my friend, colleague, and really uh, I call him my little brother. That he loves that part, um, has accomplished. So I'm going to turn it over to Nathan and get us started. 
Absolutely. So for those of you that know Tiki, you might notice that what she's wearing is in a traditional Tiki outfit. Uh, as you can see in our headshots that are there, and I pasted in the chat box or Twitters, there's a much more professional sense that we tend to address. Tiki has a shirt. You'll see my shirt here. This is intentional, and I want you to think about what are the norms that you usually see presenters present in? It's usually a bit more formal than statement t-shirts, isn't it? You're seeing two people of color in t-shirts doing our presentation. Are there assumptions that you have about us? If this wasn't about disrupting biases, what would people think about our professionalism, about our ability to present on these topics? And what we're going to go through over the next 50 minutes together is these ideas of how do we disrupt these biases? How do we disrupt these norms that tend to exist within our everyday life that we don't even know? So I'll pass it over back to Tiki to um, kind of, we want to set an intention before uh, we begin though. Absolutely, thank you, Nathan. Before we begin the core content of our program today, we wanna to acknowledge that we are living in unprecedented times. We wanna acknowledge the indigenous communities across the nation who are the first people of this country, known today as the United States. On your screen is a map of some of the first peoples of the Washington DC area, as defined by the website nativeland.ca. It is in coming together with humility and respect that we acknowledge these people and it recognized their contemporary rights for self-determination. These people include the Nacotchtank, the Anacostan, the Piscataway, and the Susquehannock. And those are the four peoples that um, are in the areas that Tiki and I currently reside. We also wanna acknowledge the ongoing devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its immediate and far-reaching effects on our homes, our families, our economic stability, our mental and physical well-being and on our society. And finally, we acknowledge the continued fight for equality and justice that black and brown people in this country have always faced every day. Black Lives Matter. As educators, we must consider if and how diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice are infused within our classrooms and throughout the entire institution of learning. One never completely disrupts their biases, it's a continual journey. And recognizing this, we come together today to consider the voices and stories of the marginalized and invisible. We consider the ways that we, as individuals and organizations, have benefited from the legacy of colonialism. So question your privileges. Understand your own history of migration and colonialism and become active agents in advancing justice and equality. Please join us in taking two centering breaths as we acknowledge our struggles and opportunities during this time together. Thank you. So on the next slide, you will see a picture, um, and this is from the Philippines. This is a uh, group of individuals moving a Bayan Kubo. Um, so Bayan Kubo is kind of a more uh, traditional indigenous house um, in the Philippines. And you'll see the hashtag building Bayan Nihan at the bottom, and this relates to my dissertation study. So a lot of this research is getting drawn from my dissertation. I'm in the writing phase, that fun phase that just never ends. Um, and my dissertation is looking at um, building by Nihan, decolonizing association management from whiteness. And I'm specifically looking at how racially minoritized volunteer leaders navigate structures of whiteness. And for me, whiteness is power and privilege. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, this study, although I'm looking at association management, uh, my co-researchers have talked about how their experiences as volunteers for their association is very similar to their experience as professionals, is very similar to their experience as um, individuals living in society. So although much of this research is drawn from an association context, Tiki and I really do believe that um, it really does translate um, to uh, kind of everyday experiences within the classroom. So on um, the next slide, you'll see the definition for by Nihan. It literally means but being in a bayan, which refers to the spirit, spirit of communal unity, work and cooperation to achieve a particular goal. So it's a community coming together to solve a problem. And that's really how Tiki and I approach this work, that we all need to be part of disrupting biases. It can't be something done in isolation. And so as we continue, and you know, there's no perfect in pandemic, I had to switch to my headset because my puppy has decided to join our conversation today. So I've put my headset on. So no, no perfect in pandemic. But as we think about our definitions 
uh, for today. Biases in and of themselves aren't necessarily bad. Some are positive and helpful, like choosing to only eat foods that are considered healthy, right? However, when positive, whether your bias is positive or negative, such cognitive shortcuts can result in prejudgments that lead to rash decisions or discriminatory practices. We also wanna think about what we mean by privilege. Now, the definition that's on your screen, of course, is from a dictionary, but really it's that some folks get special rights just for being in a group. That's what privilege is. Often these special rights or gifts are given to them and not earned. And some folks aren't even aware that they may have them. Now, a norm is really an unwritten rule that's followed by those within a specific culture. Often it's unquestioned. These are rules that can take the form of practice, belief, diet, ritual, or set of expectations. Um, if you think about some of the norms that get infused in our culture, if you bump into somebody, a good norm is to say, excuse me. Nobody necessarily said it was a rule, but we know that's kind of a rule. If two people are coming to the same space, sometimes they move. Nobody says, are you gonna move left or are you gonna move right? It's a norm and we do these things. But we wanna talk about some of the unconscious things, some of the things we don't even realize are there. Um, so I am using my headset as well as my three-year-old daughter will be running through my office, I'm sure in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, but so I mentioned I have a three-year-old daughter and you know, I'm trying to raise her um, to be conscious and, and kind of understand. And, and my husband and I are really trying not to gender her through her clothes. But what you'll see on your screen here is on the left side is girl pants and the right side is boy pants. And one of the norms that I learned because, you know, growing up a, a, as a boy and being dressed is apparently girls don't want pockets, you know, and you want the clothes to be as tight as possible and not have any space for the rocks or the slugs or the flowers or the other things that she tends to find. And I think that's just one of those norms that I didn't realize until I was brought outside of my uh, lived experience and culture. And, you know, I think, you know, everyone wants pockets. I think that's, uh, if you're going to take away one thing, you know, everyone wants pockets. On our next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about other norms, but as educators, you know, trying to be as interactive as possible in the Zoom world, if there are other norms or other ideas or if things resonate with you throughout today's session, please feel free to use the chat box um, and just kind of co-sign or add things um, such as that. Yes, uh, she is now into the dress phase and we found dress pockets and those yes. are the only things now she wants to wear. Thank you for uh, getting us started in the chat. Another thing before I switch slides is that there are things that are hidden through these norming messages. Look at the colors that are used. I apologize if you have a color difference, I'll explain. There are more pastels and pinks and reds and patterns and uh, fluffy stuff on the girl side. And then on the boy side, it tends to be more rugged and khaki and tougher material and denim. And of course, I, you know, I won't buy a dress now that has pocket, even my formal gowns now get pockets sewn, sewn into them. Here's some other fun things that are hidden in plain sight. So um, I'm hungry. It's about that time for me. And so some messaging that's hidden in plain sight. As we think about ourselves and we think about our world and our society, there are things that we get every day. There are hidden messages uh, that we get that we don't even know. So here are some hidden messages. And for time, I'm not going to make you guess. I'm going to just tell you what they are. Uh, starting from my top left, Tostitos. Do you see the two people over a bowl of salsa now with a chip? You see that one? Hershey Kisses between the K and the I is a hidden kiss. Do you see that? If you look at Wendy's, Wendy's has a scalloped uh, collar, but if you look at the, the kind of piping on the collar, it says mom, because the founder wanted the food to taste like what mom would have made you. Amazon, my favorite place or a retailer on earth, because it gets me stuff here sometimes in the same day. Amazon, uh, you see the smiley face because they want you to be happy, but they want it to have everything from A to Z, which is why that's where the smile starts and end, Amazon, A to Z. If you look in the FedEx, this is the one, well, these two, I think Nathan had a problem with when we, we did this the first time. Uh, if you look at FedEx, do you notice the arrow and the movement in the word X? 
they are moving your stuff along. So if you look between the E and an X, it forms a white arrow. Ah, I see Sharon just got that. And then last one, the G at the top of goodwill, this is the one Nathan and I fought over, the G at the top of goodwill is actually half a smile. Did you all get those? I love that people keep talking about the pockets. No, you're not slow, Sharon. They're hidden in plain sight. These are some of the subliminal messages that we get and take in every day that we're not even aware of. Before we go in any further and how you can disrupt things, now we're gonna transition and I want you to do, we had some fun. Now you're gonna do a little introspective uh, exercise with us. And I think uh, as we transition to this exercise, one of the takeaways that we hope you get from today's presentation is you need to be intentional with naming the things that you see. And you need to, as I'm a Law & Order fan, I fully own it, once the bell has been rung, you can't unhear it. And that's one of the things about biases. It's not bad that we're born into these norms. It's not your fault that these things that you don't see. But now whenever we show this slide, I see all six of those immediately. And that's partly what this hidden in plain sight, we wanted to have a more fun example of thinking about what are those sorts of um, identities. Um, so I'm going to paste into the chat box. Um, if we had more time or if we were in person, we would encourage you to do this. But um, if you haven't heard of the social identity wheel, um, this is an exercise that um, Tiki and I have done with uh, many different groups to kind of get at thinking about your identity um, and thinking about um, kind of where, where you stand. And this is um, this specific uh, social identity wheel that we're seeing is from the University of Michigan, inclusive teaching resources. And y'all can feel free to bring that into um, your classrooms. Um, this social identity wheel has expanded. And I think, as you can see on the next slide, in Jones and McEwen in 2000, um, they thought about what about a concept, uh, concept of multiple dimensions of identity? So you'll see these are very bracketed and they're very separate. And obviously there's probably even identity pieces that we don't even think about that are salient for you. But the Jones and McEwen model in 2000 uh, talked about what's your core piece? So who are you in the center and then how do these other pieces interact with you? So more like an atom and electrons. So sometimes things are gonna be very salient to you. Um, I just moved to South of Annapolis. Um, previous to that, I was in Hyattsville, actually right down the road um, from University of Maryland College Park. By race, it's always been salient, but it's even more salient South of Annapolis because I'm a one percenter. And when I was in Hyattsville, surrounded by other Latinx and black folk, it wasn't as salient for me. Or when I'm in church, perhaps, and I still identify as, as Catholic, my sexual identity is much more salient. So this idea of, and again, the, the different parts of your identity are within this larger context of the family background, the cultural experiences. This model was further developed in um, 2007 by uh, Abe's, Jonah McEwen, and um, reconceptualizing, so there's that atom that we see beforehand, but then there's meaning, a meaning-making filter. And again, this interaction or the ways that um, the fact that I am a practicing gay Catholic, but I grew up on the East Coast and I'm Filipino American and what's that mean? And all of these different areas and, and I come from a conservative family, all of these influences really reflect who we are. And that's one of the pieces that, you know, we want you to think about. So I might paste it in the chat if we had more time, uh, you know, we would uh, have you fill out. But as you can see, um, we're not going to break out into small groups, but we do want you to just think and answer maybe some of these questions for yourself. So Tiki, if you could go to the next slide. What are some of the identities that you think about most often? And again, the, the circle that you see here is more just a guide. If there are other identities or things that, that are, are more resonant for you, please feel free to think about them. And what are the identities that you think about the least often? And for me, it's why, uh, you know, I think is an important question to follow up with. But then, you know, as we think about biases, and we'll continue to talk about this further, looking at question five, what are the identities that have the greatest effect on how others perceive you? So Tiki and I will kind of model this a little bit and we'll go to the next slide and maybe one or two Tiki just to be cognizant of time. Um, but, uh, you know, I think if you want to pick first, uh, which one you want to talk about and, and share a little bit of, of your story. Yeah, sure, Nathan. Um... I heavily identify, uh, particularly now, you know, when we did this exercise the first time, even more now as uh, an African-American woman. And so if you look at, on the slide, uh, we talked about the things that are in the identity wheel and we put little red dots 
uh, next to how we identify if we felt like they were a, pr a place of privilege. Um, and so you'll see that uh, Nathan has several more dots than I do. Um, but one of the ones that I think is very interesting is that he feels privileged to be a citizen of the United States. And I feel privileged only when I'm outside of the United States. I do a lot of international travel. And as a person who is first, and I will be quite honest, uh, before the Trump era, who was just American, that afforded me certain privileges because outside of the United States, they saw American first and Black second. Whereas in the United States, I don't even know that, well, I do know this, that there are some that don't even consider me a whole American. And so I am... Uh, treated less than in my own country. So inside the United States, I don't find that uh, I am privileged at all to be American because I don't feel that because of the, when you think about what's core and salient, I know that African-American women only make about 68 to 70 cent on the dollar as opposed to their white male counterparts for the same jobs. Nathan? Yeah, you'll see and along my side, and this tended to be how I tend to navigate, is that they're not kind of clear in the boxes, there's usually a descriptor on top of the word. Um, and I think for me, you know, one of the pieces is the professional class. And I think, you know, as I've advanced and Tiki and I have had great conversations around this, you know, I, I'm an executive director now, I have a contract, I was able to name things within my contract. And what does that look like? But I grew up and, you know, my mother was a doctor, but they immigrated to the United States. And I think this evolution of identity is one of the things that's been interesting for me to navigate and to think about. And, and we offer these, and you know, I think we can move on from here, but these are just examples of how rich discussions can happen in such a short time. Many of these identities we don't really talk about or even think about. You know, the fact that it wasn't until um, maybe a little bit before, obviously my parents immigrated, so I had a, a concept uh, of nationality and, and, and being a US citizen, but it probably wasn't till 2012 with SB 1070, which was the legislation that happened in Arizona of um, giving uh, police officers the ability to ask people for their um, paperwork that I thought about how that interacted with my uh, lived experience. Or it was in 2007 that I didn't realize not everyone goes on a spring break. And I was talking to a classmate and I asked him what he's doing and he's like, well, I'm working. You know, and, and, and again, our lived experiences frame how we think about the world. And we think that whether it's doing this exercise with by yourself, maybe um, with your other colleagues and, and faculty um, and teachers, or maybe with the other administrators, it's a um, great opportunity, I think, to dive deeper and to look into um, your various roles and identities and, and think about how our identities, our context, our histories, they kind of are that lens, again, on the bottom left, that really filter our world. Muted. Haha, <laughs> I didn't do it first. You did it. You did it first. There's my baby brother coming out right now, y'all. Um, nah, nah, he got me. Uh, through that lens, we have bias. Bias impacts our perception our attitudes, our behaviors, our attentions, our listening skills, our macro, our micro affirmations. And I'm gonna just pick three of my favorites to talk about and how they might show up in our classrooms. Three of my favorite biases to talk about are the halos and horns bias, affinity bias and implicit bias. So. Really, halos and horns is actually my favorite. It's the bias that I benefited most from growing up. I was a teacher's pet. I know it's hard to believe. I was very good at getting grownups to like me. I was an only child of a single parent. I grew up around adults. So I spoke in very adult ways. I also grew up speaking another language, which people found charming. They just found it so charming that a little black girl spoke French fluently from the time she was seven. And so the halo and horns bias, and as a teacher, I had to be very careful not to have this, is that when someone does a great thing or something you find charming or wonderful, they forever can do no wrong. Everything they do is great. Nothing they do is wrong. The flip side is when someone does something wrong, one time, they can never make it up. 
never come back from it, never recover it. You never give them the opportunity to do something different or to make it up. That's an easy one to have manifest in our classrooms. Second one I wanna talk about is affinity bias. Inherently, we think more highly of people who look like us or with whom we find or think there is a connection. We assume they have more things in common with us. Maybe one of your students reminds you of you when you were younger or your best friend growing up or looks something like you. Whether this is real or implied, it leads us to have warmer and nicer feelings about these people and that we feel like we have an immediate connection to. As an adult, affinity bias happens like this. I'm often the only black woman in a room. If I see another black woman somewhere, we across the room meet eyes and I already feel connected. I could have nothing in common with this person, but because in some ways they look like me, particularly when I'm surrounded by folks who completely do not. I will assume we have some kind of connection. And lastly, implicit bias. This is one that gets a lot of uh, people talk about a lot. This is our unconscious attitudes, reactions, stereotypes, the categories that affect our behavior towards people. So um, it could be unconscious racial or socioeconomic uh, bias towards students. Think about it. Do you hold assumptions about your students' learning behaviors and their capability for academic success, which is tied to their identities or their backgrounds? For me, this manifests in an interesting way. I had to go see a throat doctor because I find that in our, my profession, I speak a lot and it has strained my throat. They wrote me a prescription to see a specialist. Of course, in the age of Google, I Googled my, profession, my uh, specialist who had a double specialty in both the throat and vocal cords, but he looked like he was 12 and a half years old. And immediately I thought to myself, how could this 12 and a half year old young person know what to do with me? And I had to check myself. So let's be clear, biases happen. It's about how you process them and whether you react to them and make them actionable is what we try to work against. Biases will happen. And I had to check myself and say, Tiki, you cannot assume that this person, just because they appear young on their website photo, doesn't know what they're talking about. You are so wrong. And I went to go see that uh, specialist and he was amazing and totally knew his stuff. And so it served as a reminder, even though I do this work, that we all have these biases that our society, our backgrounds, our lenses all, you know, come together to influence us in unconscious ways. But we're trying today to help you to start to think about how to make them more conscious and to stop the reaction, which actually is the part that has the most negative effect on others. So transitioning from those three examples, I'm gonna um, frame us a little bit with some of my study and kind of the places that are there. So I placed it into the chat. If you're interested, I haven't touched this website, I'll be honest in, in a little bit, but um, that is actually where I am putting all of my data and all of my findings. For me, the, the, there's become a meta narrative in my dissertation process in that the dissertation process itself is a manifestation of whiteness. And there are only certain journals I can use and I need to navigate the academy in a specific way. And for me, doing a critical participatory action research project, and I'll talk a little bit more shortly around that, I'm trying to decolonize the, the learning and how do I spread my knowledge to other individuals and to people that are interested. So feel free to kind of navigate there. Um, for time's sake, we're not going to watch this video, but I will paste it into the chat as well when um, time allows. But um, part of my study has uh, really focused, and uh, Tony Morrison talks about this in this video, around the concept of the white gaze. So W-H-I-T-E-G-A-Z-E, -E, so not G-A-Y-S. And um, Morrison talks about the white gaze as this outside factor that puts people of color, specifically black, um, black people in this case, in a context where white is right and white is what needs to be focused. And she talks about how through her writing, she tries not to center 
the issue or center the problem. And that's one way that we think we can disrupt biases is to really try to get outside of our norms, try to get outside of those assumptions that Tiki talked about and moving forward. Um, one of the main ways that uh, another concept that we encourage you to think about um, is, you know, uh, on your screen, you'll see um, this is from an organizational lens, but it applies really in, in personal context of these different types of tensions and the way tensions are thought about. And sometimes we think of tensions as a paradox. So it's an either or, or dualities of A and B. Or maybe it's a dilemma where do I want this or do I want that? They're both good, but which is, which is right. And for me, and I think a lot of it is being a queer Asian American, practicing Catholic, uh, you know, all of these different identities, the dialectic has been more something that resonates with me. And, and I think when we're disrupting biases, why I talk about the dialectic is that it doesn't have to be an either or. There can be a way forward that maybe just needs to be imagined in a different way. There can be a way that we don't need to be constricted by the norms or by the things that have come before us, but how do we think of moving forward? How do we create new avenues and new ways? And it's not about, you know, I'm done now. So as Tiki talked about, we're never unbiased. It's creating processes like a dialectic is of thinking how to navigate through our biases. What are those checks? Do you have an accountability buddy? Is there someone that you can go to to talk about these issues or talk about these sorts of ways? Again, just a, another kind of pop culture example. And again, my, my study is kind of trying to bring in um, some of the pop culture pieces, but uh, Yara Shahidi was acknowledged as a, a Young Gifted and Black Award from BET. And in this quote, and I'll read this out for those of you that can't see it, she talks about this dialectic. And I offer this as this is what our students today are experiencing. So she talks about, within this room, we are allowed to be our full selves. For many people, the definition of identity is, is based on who we are not. It's based on who we don't want to be, who we don't want to be perceived like. I mean, white taught me what black was not, male taught me what female was not, straight taught me what gay was not, sad taught me what happy was not, law taught me what equity, equality and equity were not. But our charge is not to live within this negative space of who we are not to be. Who are we not to be after all? And again, I think it's this imagination. It's this way to think outside of the traditional ways that we tend to navigate. And I think that's honestly one of the, and I hate to use the word benefit, but I think one of the opportunities that COVID really did create. I think it was a way, and I will speak personally within my lived experience, that I could live more authentically. I love the fact that Tiki's dog joined our presentation. And I know Tiki probably freaked out a little bit. I know my daughter, I will maybe freak out a little bit. I might apologize. But why are we apologizing for living our life? Why have we created, we've created these arbitrary separations. And obviously when working with children, there's a, there's a difference and you know, there are boundaries and ethics and, and those sorts of things. So I don't mean in that way, but I think COVID, this racial justice, this racial awakening that we're all going through is an opportunity to really move forward and think differently. And at the same time, and Tiki, if you can go to the next slide, I think this is partly what's occurring. So for those of you that can't see, the quote is uh, for this uh, cartoon by Paul North, there can be no peace until they renounce their rabbit god and accept our duck god. And there's one side, they see it as rabbit, one side they see it as a duck. And I think within racial justice, it's a little bit different. There are some facts there are some truths that, that need to be uncovered. But we all need to recognize we're coming from our own journey and our own story. And if we come at this place of war, if we come at this place that we are right and they are wrong and we need to convince them, we're not gonna be able to move past. We're not gonna be able to advance in dialogue. And I think that's one of the pieces that we really wanna think about, how do we advance? So next slide, um, I mentioned whiteness and you know, like a good scholar, I needed to ground my study in uh, kind of some uh, seminal scholars and definitions. And this was Ruth Frankenberg, talked about whiteness as a location of structural advantage of race privilege. Um, second, as a standpoint or a perspective. And then third, a set of cultural practice or norms. But what we've done, and, and as I've moved through my study, next slide Tiki, I now know that you know, whiteness did mean that but I actually wanted to co-create with my co-researchers, what does whiteness mean for them? So it's not the color, it's not necessarily white people or white culture, it's power, privilege, and the maintenance of norms. 
And it's these ideas of how does these norms continue to reify and move forward. And um, we're gonna offer now some examples and I'll pass it over to Tiki to think about how whiteness manifests within education. And now that you know these norms, how can we disrupt them together? So this quote by W.E.B. Du Bois always gets me. I've read it many times throughout the years. And so I wanna take a moment, I'm not going to read to you. I made it big enough. I think that you're gonna be able to read it. But if you think about how many people, not just black folk, but this comes from the soul of black folks, many people often to fit in, to move ahead or to advance, often have to be people of two or more souls. One of the ways that happens is really about code switching. And so I'm gonna stop for just a moment to give you a second to read as we center ourselves in this next section. As a teacher, uh, I started my career in middle schools. As a teacher, I always wanted my classroom to be a place where all children could come and be themselves. Now, young and bright eyed and 21 years old when I started, I thought I would just you know, accept everybody as they are, not understanding the systems in which they come to the space and the things that sometimes the implicit or unconscious biases that our systems have that affect them. Look at these children. This is what is acceptable to wear to school. They all look like versions of the same. I'll hark back to girl clothing and boy clothing. You'll notice that this is from a, um, it's a Shutterstock photo from a uh, online uh, uniform store. All the girls are in uh, penny loafers or acceptable shoes with stockings and pleated skirts or straight skirts and sweaters and scalloped collars and all the boys are in you know regular pants and shoes that look like and as my mother would say take a punch but code switching is all about fitting in and, and adhering to the norms and playing to the strengths of our biases but think about who gets to set the rules about that this what you see on your screen is the acceptable way for students to come to school sometimes our code switching or the rule setting is about language it's a certain code or an etiquette that's required to be seen as valuable, whereas slang and or other dialects aren't accepted unless the folks in power adopt them. An example of that is I have heard many folks who say things like, girl, hey girl, that inherently comes from the African-American culture and is only acceptable once folks in power decide that it's cool to use. There is a very distinct look that about what is acceptable or neat or pressed or professional. I was told that my students needed to see me in makeup every day and that I needed to wear pearls to school as a teacher because that's the example I needed to set. And so I dusted off now, I'm an AKA and I love my pearls, but I love my pearls because it's part of my sorority and I love them, but I was told what was acceptable to wear and what was professional looking. What messages are we sending to those who can't afford pearls or who don't have the clothing that we think is acceptable? One of the other ones is thinking about fit. How does the person fit in with us? How do they fit in with our systems? How do they fit in with our classrooms? I'm not gonna bend the way I do things in my classrooms to help the students succeed or feel more comfortable. I'm gonna tell them how they have to fit in. As a young teacher, I was told you got to have classroom norms and you've got to write them up on wonderful lined paper. I'm left handed. I can never write straight unless I had that big, pretty lined paper and hang it in my classroom about classroom norms. And this is how you must act here. Forcing my students to code switch into the chat as we move forward. I want you to think about what are other ways that you as a professional, as a teacher, as an adult, have had to code switch in your life and how do we force our children and our students to code switch to be accepted? Another example that people don't like to look at, take these two pictures. Now, if we had more time, I would have put them up one at a time and really talk to you about what do you see here? Usually what we get is that the man looks powerful and assertive and the woman looks angry. Forbes did a 2020 uh, article that said, 
Black women especially are under pressure to, perf- to conform to white dominant behaviors. Men are seen as confident, white men particularly, and, and decisive and forceful and independent. Black women are seen as assertive and angry or having an attitude. They are told that it makes them unlikable, that they should smile more, and they are less likely to be groomed for leadership. Marilyn, my Marilyn, I'm about to bring this home to you. So I believe in walking your talk. Marilyn, uh, the Maryland State Department of Education, preparing world-class students. I looked on the website. It was very hard for me to see anything about inclusivity on the website. And when I did look at the Department of Education's website, it talked about being welcoming for all family, but nothing about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. From uh, a study came a task force on achieving uh, academic equity and excellence for black boys. This this, uh, task force ran from July of 20 to July of 21. And part of their recommendation is that they need to provide financial incentives, incentives to recruit and retain diverse teachers and administrators. Here, Joan, I'm gonna ask you to just mute yourself. Sorry, you're moving around just a little bit. Here's, I'm going to, I'm going to get to it. So they wanted to put, they put it in the recommendation. You got to do something to recruit and retain teachers of color. And I'm going to ask, I did not pull stats from the University of Maryland College Park because my heart didn't want those stats, but I'm going to talk about regular Maryland. So the breakdown of Maryland is, these are all folks in Maryland, about 58 and a half percent are white, 31.1 percent are black, 10 are Hispanic or Latino, 6 identify, 6.7 percent identify as Asian. I was actually proud to see that they said two or more races, almost three percent, and then um, we get lower and lower with our total population. In public schools overall, 79.3 percent of teachers overall, this is nationwide, are white. 9.3% of teachers are Hispanic, 7% are Black, 2% are Asian, and then it was not statistically significant enough to report on the others. In Maryland, because you can't see this as my mouse gets stuck, there we go. 74.4% are white. This is edtrust.org that reports this. 74.4% of teachers are white. 17.3% are Black. Remember, African Americans make up 31% of the folks in Maryland. 3% of teachers are Latino and 5.4% others. But here are your students. In Maryland, Ed Truss in 2019 reports, 38% of your students are white. 38%. 34% are Black. 16.4% are Latino. And then they lumped everyone else. I can't even get into the how that's not okay. They lumped everyone else into 11.3%. There they are side by side. Now, what this means for you as teachers and educators is that while 50% of K through 12 public school students in Maryland are Black or Latino, only 20% of the teachers are. That means over 34 thousand black or Latino young children attend a school where they have no same race teachers. One in five schools have not one black teacher in it. 40% of schools don't have a Latino teacher in it. 30% of all white students, that's 96,000 Maryland students, attend a school where there is no black teacher and 43.5% of them attend a school where there is no Latino teacher. How will we teach them to accept difference and embrace cultures when we don't even have teachers and administrators who look like the very children we serve? I challenge you today to try to make a difference. To take these statistics, Nathan and I will give you all of, we, we are always grounded in statistics and all of our sites, we will give these to you. Ask your counties, what are our demographics? 
Ask your schools, what are our demographics and what are we doing about it? Ask your government, what are the demographics and what are we doing about it? And part of disrupting biases is around learning. And I think that's part of the reason, you know, we wanted to ground this in the statistics and why um, Diggy in particular did a lot of this uh, deeper research in who are our teachers, who are our students, because now that you know, as Diggy noted, what are we going to do about it? Um, so as we wrap up, I think a few other kind of ways that whiteness manifests um, and, and thinking about the ideas of agendas. So this came up with about two or three of my co-researchers. And not that agendas in and of themselves are whiteness, but have you been in a meeting where you were told, that's not on the agenda, we'll talk about it later. It gets parking lot, does it ever come up again? Or the way that someone within the agenda can drive the meeting. And how do we try to disrupt those ideas? Or even just the concept of best practices. Again, not that these things are problematic in and of themselves, but how do we take a critical eye at what a best practice is and then really think about, well, who is this based upon? Who were the sample that really created this best practice? And how can we uh, apply an equitable lens on this sort of work? As we wrap up, I'm uh, gonna talk a little bit. A lot of my study, as I mentioned, was a critical participatory action research study. Um, and this was one of the main books and um, just a very high level uh, concept of what CPAR is. It's a way to document issues and then create change in the simplest manner. And for me, this is an opportunity that again, if you've identified the issues within your community and it's not just the faculty getting together and teachers, it's also how do you include your students What's a plan for how you can disrupt a bias or an issue on your campus? You do an action, so you go ahead and, and try to implement uh, that plan. You observe the changes, you reflect on what that looks like, and then you rinse and repeat. And CPAR specifically talks about norms or whiteness or the framework. These norms manifest in three different ways. They think about in the sayings or the language that we use, the doings or the activity and work that gets done and the relatings or the power structure and the solidarity. And Tiki, if you go to the next slide, um, and again, we'll share these slides and we have links to the original documents. Um, this is how they talk about the practice architecture or this idea of norms and the sayings, doings and relatings and how they create this architecture that just maintains norms. So what we offered, and again, as we wrap up today, so sayings, doings and relatings, um, what's following on the slides, and we apologize that we don't have time, but uh, again, take this and, and feel free to use this. So sayings, and again, this comes from CPAR, is what is said and thought rational? So are there ideas in the field that are dominant and how is language used to reinforce? Or where, and where does the specific language come from? And we can encourage you to come break into small groups, think about these ideas, document the, the problems, and then think about the change. Or when it comes to doings, um, and the way that we do things is what is done, resources used, and the infrastructure set sustainable. So that's really the thing you think about. So who is doing what to reinforce the norm? What physical spaces are used or not used? How are the resources distributed? And then finally, relatings, or are the social arrangements just? How do hiring practices used to reinforce the norm? Are there systems of positions, roles, or functions that influence the norm? And again, very high level questions. But these are ways that you can maybe start thinking about, well, what are these norms that exist, these biases, these things that we don't think about that exist within our culture? How, and how do we come together to kind of think of, of a way out? So all that being said, you know, we've offered some conclusions and ideas. Um, uh, you know, knowing's half the battle, but where do you go from here? And, you know, as we wrap, what are some other ideas? Just a quote from one of my co-researchers, Maria Luisa. Um, and so even though I can always point out criticism and everything everywhere, I can also still find positives and be grateful for all of the experiences that I've had, including association leadership and membership. I've still been able to find my people. And I think that's really important, especially in a field that's dominated by whiteness and was literally started in tenants rooted in white supremacy. But yeah, that's just my final reflection, it's complicated. And I think that it's hard work and, and we really encourage you, we applaud you for being here, for mm -hmm. making the time this, this afternoon to to find um, some time to reflect and think about these ideas. But it is a complicated piece of work. And um, now that we, uh, we've been here. So uh, yeah, absolutely, Nathan. And, and you can always tell that Nathan is the uh, more, verbo more verbose of us, but this Maya Angelou quote, 
uh, sums up what we hope you take away. You do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, you do better. We fully recognize that change, systemic and sustained change will take more years than we have on this earth. But if we all do our part, we'll be able to move the needle. If we all decide to challenge the norms that, um, that we see, challenge our own biases, the biases of our friends and families, we truly can make a difference. I'm gonna stop sharing so we can see all of you. We are so thankful to all of you who decided to join us. And we thank you so much for your time and attention and wish we had more time to talk with you all. Thank y'all so much. And I'm gonna turn it over, I think, to UMD Testudo or our very own Kurt. Hello, thank you very much. I am going to actually turn it over to our, uh, the, uh, our fearless leaders of the College of Education Alumni Network Board. And this is a, a group of some very dedicated alumni who are making a real difference in serving alumni and students at the College of Education. I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara Friedlander, who is the president of the alumni, uh, the College of Education Alumni Network. Thank you so much for being here and thank you to our speakers. I, I for one, am glad to see some of my work family here on the call today because I think I'm going to set up a meeting so we can debrief because I need to reflect and talk and think about everything that you just taught me. It would be great to have for you to do that with some colleagues too, to be able to bring together and, and uh, you just gave us so much to think about. So thank you, thank you, thank you. In the chat, I put the link to the Alumni Association. If you are not a member yet, please, please consider joining. Tell them that uh, when you join, tell them Barbara and Norker sent you. We, uh, we really appreciate it that um, you not only get to do some of this professional development, but we also have a very active board, some social situations that we're gonna be planning. Um, and then also a lot of alumni funds go towards scholarships for students, which we know in today's world, uh, students are, will be needing. So please consider joining. The link is in the chat. And thank you, thank you for coming today, for learning alongside of us. We really appreciate it. And uh, there's more coming. Professional development is not over. We uh, will spend the summer planning. Tiki is not off the hook yet. So <laughs> we are gonna do lots and lots of planning and put uh, a learning progression out for next year. So thanks for coming. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, everybody. That concludes our, our presentation. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. We're so glad you were here. I'm hanging out, Kurt. I didn't know if you wanted us to hang at the end. Uh, yes, let's go ahead and do at, that. At eight, yeah. Can our two, I think it's everybody now. Oh, very good. All right. Wow, All right. what an amazing way to end this. Oh my gosh. This Where's Tiki? Is awesome. Tiki out here? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think oh, she was Tiki. Oh my gosh. That was Amazing. Oh my, that was so good. That was so was good. So good. <laughs> and our our equity office from Montgomery County was here watching. And I'm texting Barbara going, this takes everything to a different level. Like nice. come on, everybody, in solidarity. Get we all have to get better. Mm -hmm. I really so like good. that. I really like that example of the um um uh, Halo. Um, yes, the three. I've never seen that, that before. That, no, I hadn't seen it quite like that. And it really is for, um, I think, consistent biases it's that like we can all have. Like, because you could apply not just to the classroom, but even in a job context. Like, if someone, you know what I mean? Like, we have a halo effect over people, or a, so it was just really challenging me and, and lots of other stuff. Um, too bad we just didn't have time to, like, I wanted to, I kept, I kept, and I'm usually not in the chat space, but I kept sending stuff in the chat oh, space. Sharon. I think next year would be a great upgrade is to then offer a session to just reflect. Just come and talk about what we learned. Yeah, especially if they, if the same people come back. So we'll have to spend some, you know what I'm saying? Cause, um, but I hear you. Like we need time to just even engage the audience a little bit more. But anyway, let me stop talking. I thought it was, 
But okay, what, what, what's being done in this space that's very, very, very different in other spaces is it's pushing it way beyond and it's bringing in the research and it's building community and it's gathering more ideas. Good, good. Um, this has to keep going. And I think this should continue to be our focus. Definitely. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. There's definitely, well, you know, we got, we're doing that. We want to do the panel, Norka, that you're going to sit on. We haven't, we just ran out of time this year because I think that's very important. Um, the other two presenters have some really unique perspective. Kurt, back to our um, teaching difficult histories, that panel. Like, I think mm -hmm. we have, so anyway, we've got a lot we can, we can, we can um, go back to and I'm sure you guys will get some other good ideas. Okay, I have to drive my daughter somewhere. Yes. She's like, she's like, are you done? Are you done? Are you done? So I think it's time. Uh, thank yes. you. Thank you. I'll see you guys next week. Have a good summer break. Board meeting next week. See you then. Next week, right? Yeah. Yep. And what do we have next week? Am I missing yeah, something? Board meeting. I'm going to send an email. Oh, I put a maybe because my daughter's graduating and we have family coming in. And so I was looking at the, re what you call them, date. I'll try, but I think it's in the evening, right? What was it? Yeah. I'll try. I'll look at it. Yeah, okay. I'm a maybe, you guys. It's going to be kind of tight for me, but. It's I'll okay. It's always family first, Sharon. So do yeah, but I'll catch back up. If I can get in, I will. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 -bye. Sharon, Great job, Kurt.